Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. As movie makers explore new and unfamiliar territory and subject matter, they oftentimes use their prior experiences to fill in any information that might be missing. Take a world like Pandora, for instance. It might seem exotic and alien to us as viewers trying to enjoy the movie, but if we were actually to find Pandora in real life, scientists would be amazed by how similar it is to Earth. The local talking monkeys oddly look like humans and even have horse-like mounts that they ride. Of course, everything is scaled up a bit more and a bit more fluorescent on the world, but it's a comfortable and familiar environment for our viewers to see. And that's important because we want the audience to be familiar. They don't want to be so jarred by the setting that they can't focus on other things that are more important like the characters and the story development. Although in Avatar, I think that was missing. But anyway, in the science fiction genre, more than any other genre, the artists are given more uh, uh, creative liberty because oftentimes they're delving into subject matter that our human race has yet to encounter. And so imagination and visual creativity oftentimes replace reality, especially when we don't know where reality is. And one of the things that science fiction always gets wrong is how they portray space combat. It's the most exciting part of any space opera, and it's what really draws the mainstream audiences to these movies. Unfortunately, the realities of what space combat will look like will be very different from what we see in science fiction movies. It's probably going to be a lot more boring and a lot slower. Anyway, today I want to take a look at five major things that sci-fi movies get wrong about space combat. When I first read through Ender's Game as a child, I didn't really understand the idea behind Battle School. What was its purpose? Ender's Game was about all these children who were selected from around the world to attend an extremely prestigious military academy floating in orbit called Battle School. These children were supposed to be the future commanders and officers of Earth's invasion fleet of a hostile alien race known as the Formix. These young cadets would one day command the greatest battleships and carriers of humanity in epic space melees. The battle room was a zero gravity room at the center of battle school. You trained, slept, and practiced with your army and constantly went to the battle room where you would battle other armies in mock skirmishes. But these battles had nothing to do with starships and commanding fleets, or so I thought. You see, every cadet serves as an infantryman and was given a non-lethal stun gun. It was basically a laser tag in zero gravity. It seemed like a lot of fun, but it didn't really make much sense. Why aren't these kids learning about naval strategies or you know how to manage logistics for an invasion fleet? But then I realized fighting in space is very different from anything we encounter here on Earth. The idea behind the battle room was not only to learn how to lead people into combat, but also to get these cadets used to fighting in zero gravity 3D space, which is an extremely difficult thing to do if you're not born in zero gravity. The simple task of just getting oriented and knowing where your enemy is can be very difficult to do and disorienting. When you're fighting on a planet, there are a lot of reference points to use for navigation, and it's much easier to get around. There's also gravity, which limits where your enemy can come from. Now, obviously, there are planes and helicopters and cliffs and, and tunnels below you, but for the most part, your enemy will be fighting at the same level as you. Ground battlefields just lack the same type of verticality you'll see in uh, space battles. And in space battles, because there are no gravity, oftentimes your horizontal planes turn into your vertical planes, which gets even more nauseating and confusing. This will be really disorienting for most people who aren't used to zero gravity, especially because our brains and bodies have evolved to handle walking around on Earth's gravity and not floating in space. And things get even more confusing when these battles happen in deep space when there's not even planets or stars around to give you reference points. But aside from Ender's Game, we don't really see much zero gravity orientation training in sci-fi movies which really should be the first step in training anyone who gets involved in these type of battles, whether they're a space marine or a rear admiral. Not Damon. So now you got your zero G orientation and terminology down, you can effectively move and communicate with your fellow soldiers in 3D environments. That's great. But it's only the beginning, now you're gonna have to learn orbital mechanics. Which honestly I learned from a video game called Kerbal Space Program. You see, you don't just fire up your ship and point it at the sky and hope for the best. There's tons of preparation and mathematical calculations being made. Let's say you wanna to go to Mars from Earth. Well, if you point your ship straight at Mars and attempt to fly at it, even if you manage to get to that spot, Mars will have moved already and you're gonna to have to lead it. Instead, what you have to do is calculate how long it will take your ship to reach Mars and figure out where Mars will be in its orbit after that time. Ideally, you'd want to do this orbit transfer when Mars and Earth are at their closest points. This could save you weeks, if not months, if done correctly. 
Now that you've figured out where Mars will be in its orbit, you can't just point your ship directly at where you think it's going to be. Gravity is still in play in space. And to be a successful space pilot, you're going to have to let those gravitational forces work for you rather than against you. When you launch your ship from Earth or from a battle station over Earth, you immediately enter Earth's orbit. Hopefully a stable orbit, which means an orbit that does not increase or decrease in distance from the body it's revolving around. When you're orbiting a planet, you can do three things. Maintain a stable orbit, increase your orbit size, or decrease the size. Now there are going to be two coordinates that are going to help you to increase and decrease your orbit. They're called the retrograde and the prograde. The retrograde is the point that goes directly against the rotation of your orbit. So if you burn retrograde, you're burning against the orbit and it gets smaller and smaller until it's no longer a stable orbit and turns into a re-entry. If you burn prograde, you're going with the direction of your orbit's rotation, which will increase your distance from the object and speed until you have enough speed to launch and escape out of the orbit of the planet you're around. Now, obviously, there are limitations to our current technology. Chemical rocket boosters and hydrogen peroxide thrusters are still relatively primitive compared to what we see in most sci-fi franchises. But even then, understanding orbital mechanics will give you a huge advantage in how you control the movement of your ship. For instance, a ship that is in low orbit around Earth is most likely traveling at around 17,000 miles per hour. That seems really fast, but in space, it's not anything special. Let's say a few Martians have slingshotted around their planet and are now approaching Earth to attack the ships in low orbit. They're not going to burn retrograde to slow down in order to enter Earth's orbit. They're just going to fly right by us and launch whatever weapons they have at us and basically not slow down. This really limits their exposure to enemy fire. As a defender, you probably should know that being in low orbit at such slow speeds is a huge danger. You might as well be a sitting duck. This is just one of the many situations that captains are going to have to take into account when fighting in space. Everything is going to be about orbital mechanics, gravity, and, and using energy in a very different way from how we're used to here on Earth. There's nothing more exciting than a close-range dogfight. You have these two individuals strapped into these flying machines that are fighting very hard against gravity to stay in air, and at the same time they're fighting for the perfect position against their opponent so that they can strike. There's something very romantic about this struggle and trying to fly, but it's not something that really translates into space battles. For one, the distances in space are immense, and although space travel seems very tranquil and calm in these movies, it's only because we have no visual context uh, around these ships to, to, to make us understand how fast they're actually moving. In space, forces like gravity don't just pin you to the ground, they pull you in multiple directions depending on the source, and there's no friction from air pressure as well. This means that spaceships can accelerate for a much longer time and reach a much higher top speed. On Earth, the faster you go, the more air pressure you're going to encounter, ultimately requiring you to design more aerodynamic frames. But even then, you're going to have limitations that you're never going to see in space. Now, given the choice between an extremely maneuverable ship and a very fast ship, well, which one would be better for space battles? Well, at the end of World War II, the Germans introduced the ME-262. It was one of the first jet fighters in the world. Although almost every Allied fighter was more reliable and more maneuverable than the ME-262, the jet fighter was easily 100 miles faster than any of the propeller planes that the Allies had. Instead of trying to dogfight and turn with the Allied pilots, the ME-262 pilot would just build up a massive amount of speed and do an attack run, and then just fly off into the distance again and set up another attack. None of the propeller planes could really keep up with this really, really fast ship. And in space where the distances are even more vast and there's even more space to fly around, well, I think top speed is going to be very, very important. A lot more important than maneuverability, which is only important in close range dogfights and confined spaces, which you're not going to see in space battles. No, a lot of sci-fi obviously portrays space battles as if they were dogfights. Look at how these X-wings bank their wings and use lift to help them make tighter turns as if they were in atmosphere. None of this really makes a lot of sense, but it should be mentioned that Star Wars has a lot of World War II influences behind it. Uh, George Lucas has admitted that he basically took a lot of elements from a movie called Dam Busters when he set up the Battle of Yavin and the final run on the Death Star. He even takes some lines of dialogue directly from that movie and just implants it into Star Wars. I'll fly across the dam as you make your run and try and draw the flag off you. I'm gonna cut across the axis and try and draw their fire. Lucas also looked at a lot of World War II gun cam footage in order to understand how the starship should move around, which of course was completely wrong, but the fans loved it. And because Star Wars became so popular, it kind of set the standard for space battles, for better or worse. 
Now, if there is one franchise that gets Star Fighter Combat correct, it's Babylon 5. The SA-23E Mitchell Hyundai Star Fury had four particle thrust engines arranged at the end of four struts that come out from the body of the ship. The location at the outermost edge of the ship gives these thrusters extra leverage and allows the ship to spin quicker on its central axis. It's exactly how real spaceships work too. They use vectoring uh, thrusters to orient their ship in the right direction so they can burn retrograde or prograde. I mean, this is a really unavoidable fact of space travel and space flight. And, uh, you know, space combat cannot happen without these elements. Also, most starships should have off-board firing or the ability to attack targets that aren't directly lined up with the front of your ship. Because again, we're vectoring with our entire ship, so it's not really practical to always have to aim your ship in the direction of your enemy when you're firing, right? Onboard firing was just a result of technological limitations. I mean, the first prop planes fitted with machine guns solved the issue of firing through the propeller by just making the propeller bulletproof. S safety standards were kind of different back then. The invention of larger planes led to the creation of gun turrets that can rotate and track enemies in any direction. Then in the jet age, we had things like guided missiles and helmet-controlled auto guns. The idea of fixing lasers and rail guns to the front of your ship that have to be manually pointed by your pilot is a very archaic and ancient idea. It does not belong on a starship. I'm really worried about the new Top Gun. I just don't think it's going to be as good as the old one. And one of the main reasons why is how much aerial combat has changed since the 80s. Well, even back then, jet fighters were engaging each other at increasingly longer ranges when compared to Vietnam or Korea and World War II. Today, with advanced detection capabilities and long-range missiles, an F-35 can track multiple targets from 100 miles away and simultaneously launch several missiles at them and take them all out at the same time. It doesn't really seem fair, but for all those individuals hating on the F-35's poor performance and aerodynamics, well, they're kind of missing the point. You see, the F-35 is not primarily designed for dogfighting. Nor should it be, because there really haven't been any close-range dogfights since the 70s or 80s. And if you think distances in aerial combat are far, wait until you get to space combat. In space, you'll be able to spot your enemies from a million miles away. The Expanse kind of does an awesome job at showing this. In the first season, when the Canterbury is destroyed, the crew doesn't even see the enemy ship because it's so far away. And that is how most battles will happen in space, way beyond visual range, just like how aerial battles take place here on Earth right now, way beyond visual range. So everything will revolve around stealth technology, detection ability, long-range missiles, and countermeasures like flares or point defense autocannon. So as you guys can tell, I have a lot to say about this topic, and I actually have a lot more points I wanted to talk about, like for instance, creating debris fields in orbit. That is a huge nightmare. But if you guys want to see more content about, uh, you know, maybe a part two about, you know, this topic, uh, let me know in the comment section below. Maybe we'll do it. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie, and you are the protagonist.